My name's Kieran Trainer. I'm the Regional Sales Manager for ABC Gym Sales. Um, if you were hoping to see Steffi today, my colleague, unfortunately she couldn't make it, so you'll be stuck with me. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about my background. I, I've worked in the fitness industry for around 10 years now, or coming up to 10 years. Seven to eight of them years were in sales teams, selling memberships at various operators around the UK. So Total Fitness, uh, David Lloyd and Virgin Active. Uh, and it's, it's something I got into, if I'm being honest, for, for the money. Um, but stayed for because of how um, we changed people's lives in that industry. Um, does anybody know what gym sales is? Show of hands. I know you know what it is. Um, so, regardless of the name, we don't sell gyms. We are a lead and sales management software tool that we help um, sales teams and independent operators and leisure centers manage their lead flows by capturing, nurturing and converting leads into ongoing members. And we do that in an automated and omni-channel approach. Um, and we help you build out sort of your, your templates, your automations, your sales cadences, your follow-up processes. Um, so that's a little bit more about the ABG, uh, ABC Gym Sales. Now, I'm not here to pitch you or sell you on ABC Gym Sales. That's not what I'm here to do. I'm here to talk about sales. I'll, I'll paint a little bit of a picture of the session today. So we're going to talk about what a great salesperson looks like, um, what the qualities of a great salesperson are. Um, we're going to touch a little bit about who does sales in your facilities and the stigma around sales, because let's be honest, there is a bit of a stigma around the word sales. Um, and then we're going to go through a little bit of the sales journey for our inquiries and our members. And then we're going to conclude. So the goal of today's session is to address the misconceptions and stigma associated with sales and highlight its true value and significance. Let me ask you a question. Um, when you think of a great salesperson, or if you've had a great sales experience, what does that look like for you guys? Anyone? Perfect. I'm glad you said that. And I hear you. Um, <laughs> This is a great quote from uh, Jeffrey Gittimer. It's great salespeople are relationship builders who provide value and help their customers win. And I think that's an amazing quote for the industry that we work in. It's so true. You know, when we're speaking to clients or inquiries or members, we're helping them get to a goal that they've told us about. Um, some essential qualities of a great salesperson that I think are practicing active listening. So. Um, that's definitely a, a good point. Finding an emotional connection with that person. Understanding our product or our service, shall we say, in, in the gym industry. Uh, approaching sales as a service. Being honest and transparent, which is key. And then building trust by asking great questions. Now, the three that really stick out for me and the ones that I used to implement when I worked in sales in, in health clubs are practicing active listening. And you're absolutely right. We need to listen to what our customers' needs and goals are. We need to make sure that they feel that we care about them, that we hear them. And then when we present back our membership <laughs> options or our solutions, it's tailored to their, their needs. Approaching sales as a service, now this is quite, it's not easy for us to do, but because we're, we're selling a lifestyle, if you will, they're not buying a tangible product off us. So we, we have to approach it as a service. Um, it's not just about, oh, this is the gym, this is the weights. We need to approach it as we're going to help you get to your goals, change your life. We understand your needs, and this is the support you're going to get throughout that journey. And then building trust by asking great questions. Now, I think these two tie in together because when we ask great questions, it allows us to listen to what they're telling us. Um, and all the best salespeople do this. Um, it allows us to ask the right questions, hear what the, um, what the lead or the member might be telling us, and then um, it allows us to relay that information back to them in a tailored way. So these are just some of the qualities that I think of when I think of a great salesperson. Now, understanding sales. I believe everybody works in sales, whether that be professionally or personally. Now, I'm going to ask you a question now. How many times in your personal life have you asked someone um, or someone you know, or a friend or a family member, and you've told them you want to go somewhere, and then you start selling them on that, per, uh, that place you want to go. So let's say a, a restaurant, for example. 
my friend wants to go and have a pizza, but I want to go for a Chinese. I'll start selling the Chinese on him. I'm saying, oh, you'll, you'll love it here. The service is brilliant. The food's excellent. You're going to love it. So you're doing it all the time without realizing. Um, it's subconscious. So when I ask the question that everybody works in sales, who do you think is responsible for sales in your facility? Everyone. Absolutely everyone. Some people think it's just the salespeople. Some people think it's just the PTs. It is everyone. Everyone has an input uh, for sales in your club, whether that be reception, your marketing teams, your personal trainers, or sometimes your best salespeople, because um, they're the ones who are having conversations with members throughout the day. It could even be your cleaners, you know. I used to make a, a, a beeline for two different members of staff when I worked in the gym industry um, to make sure I introduced that tour to two members of staff, just so they felt more part of a community. Um, and then you've also obviously got your owners, your sales teams, and then your members and guests. Now, if they have a great experience, they will sell the place for you. Interestingly, 65% of all new business comes from member or customer referrals. And the lifetime value of a referred member um, increases up to 16% compared to a non-referred member. So it's all about nailing that, that journey throughout their, their lifetime with you. Now, yes, there's a stigma around sales, of course. Um, question, when, when we talk about stigma around sales, what profession do you think of? Boom! Danny DeVito, Matilda. My daughter's absolutely in love with it at the moment, and when I knew I was doing this uh, presentation, he's the first person that come to mind. Now, this guy turns people's clocks back on their mileage. We don't trust people like this. But that's just a stereotype. You know, um, people think of that when they hear the word sales and they think of a second-hand car salesperson. And that's because they've had bad experiences in the past. 42% um, of consumers have a negative perception of salespeople because of the below. So pushy sales tactics, dishonesty, not listening, uh, talking too much, which I feel like I'm doing at the moment, um, negative experiences, and then failing to deliver on the promises. Now, I'd like to think in the fitness industry, we are positioned a little bit differently. Um, would you think that we're perceived differently to a second-hand car salesperson? I'd like to think so. Uh, and the reason I'd like to think that is because we actually love changing people's lives. So we're not forcing people into something. We might do it, you know, assumptively or um, consultatively, but we're not trying to force people into something that they don't want to buy. Um, and the reason why sales uh, in the fitness industry holds a unique position is because of these things, you know. We're positively impacting people's lives. We're helping them achieve a goal that they've told us about. We're focusing on health, well-being and personal growth. Uh, we're making our members feel part of a community. Um, oftentimes you'll see your members more times than you'll see your friends. So it's, it's really important. And then we believe in the product we're selling. I should have changed the product part to service because it's a service. Although there are tangible products inside our gyms, we're selling them a service. Now, we've talked about the stigma around sales, who's responsible for sales, what sales means. Um, but the sales journey for our members and our inquiries um, starts during the follow-up process. Now, you're going to get members that come in via walking or phoning or someone might come in as a guest and that journey starts there. But a lot of the time, someone will acquire on your website or they'll phone up, and then it's all about nailing the follow-up process. So let me, let me put the question out to the room. If you're an operator, does anybody have a blueprint in regards to their follow-up process that they use every single time with every single inquiry that comes in? Yeah? Can you tell me a little bit about that? <laughs> Do you have one, but you don't use it? Okay, and what does that look like? Yeah, so when we talk about the follow-up process, there's some really interesting statistics around the, the, the pitfalls of when we don't follow up. So 72% of all sales calls aren't answered, which is mind blowing. Um, the average membership sales consultant only follows up one to three times. 
And then that leads on to these on the, uh, the right hand side. So 80% of all sales are made on the fifth to 12th contact. So these guys are already missing out straight away. 30 to 50% of sales go to the vendor that responds first. So we always tell our clients it's imperative that you get in contact with an inquiry within the first hour. If you don't, uh, the chances of them joining your gym nearly halves because nine times out of 10, where they're at in their buying journey, they're um, inquiring to other places as well, not just yourselves. Uh, the optimal number of call attempts is six and 95% of all converted leads are reached by the sixth call attempt. And then 92% of salespeople give up after the fourth call, but 80% of prospects say no four times before saying yes. And that, that makes me think, have you seen that picture of the guy that's digging for a diamond in the cave? and he turns around and the guy below him who goes one more gets to it. That's exactly what that is. Um, now, when we look at a good follow-up process, what does that look like? So here's just an example of a follow-up process that we, we recommend. So following up quickly, so within that first hour, and that doesn't have to be just by a phone call, that can be via an email or a text. Um, use a variety of methods. So phone call, but 72% aren't answered. So we need to utilize text messages and emails. Um, keep it simple, 160 characters, and then when it's an email, the subject line absolutely matters and the content matters. So it doesn't have to be a salesy email, it can be an educational email. It could be something that you're running at the moment which is gonna be a community thing, you know, like a run in the park or whatever it may be that someone can get involved in. Have a planned cadence. So we talked about 80% um, of sales are made on the fifth to 12th contact. It's important that we have a planned cadence so we know how many touch points we're having with that inquiry. Um, it can take up to 12 touch points to reach a prospect. So we need to exhaust all, all avenues really and that's why the omni-channel approach is a, is a better approach. And then tracking your success metrics so you can't manage what you can't measure. And what I mean by that is if you're sending out emails to 100 leads that are in your database and you don't know what the success rate of the reply is or the appointments you're getting back from it or the sales, you don't know if it's working. Um, the same with phone calls, you're not sure when they're answering or if they're answering, so it's important that you track what, you, uh, what you're doing. Now, once we've done the follow-up process, usually we've spoken to that person, we're getting them into the club, we're having a conversation with them. Um, and again, it's Jeffrey Gittimer with an amazing uh, statement. So, and, and I, I truly believe this is uh, true in the gym industry. It's not a hard sell, it's a heart sell. Good questions get to the heart of the problem or the need very quickly, and the buyer doesn't feel like he or she is being pushed. So when we ask good questions, they, they feel part of the buying journey and the, the buying process. Here are some top tips on, on closing a sale when you are speaking to potential members. So don't be a pushy salesperson like our friend Danny DeVito. It's important that we make it a collaborative and a consultative approach so they feel like they've got a buy-in as well. Make sure you take the time to pre-qualify everyone. Now, show of hands if you're an operator, how often are you doing a needs analysis with every inquiry that comes in? That's the most important part of joining a member, in my eyes. Um, it's imperative that you do that with every single member. And the reason for that is when we pre-qualify someone and sit down with them to do a needs analysis, it allows us to ask great questions which build trust, which then makes it easier for us to you know, build little nuggets for the tour. So they'll tell us little things about themselves. We'll find out what their why is. So when it comes to the tour, we can actually relay that information to them and make it personal rather than a, a show and point. Um, each tour should be different for each guest, that goes without saying. So if someone tells me that they are interested in classes and losing weight, and I take them straight over to the weight section, they're gonna think, well, you've not listened to what I've just told you. And they're gonna feel like you're just another pushy salesman. Um, uh, make assumptive statements throughout the tour. Now, this is a great one, and it's something that we always used to use during the gym process and the, and the tour process. Uh, and that can look like, when you're a member, this is where you'll um, sign in or this is where when you remember this is where you'll lock your bags up and your belongings and when you join the gym how many days a week are you going to be coming when you replace the the word if with when it helps them feel like the the buying decision is being made already um, and then again get as many yeses on the tour as possible I used to set myself a target of getting three yeses off uh, off a, a tour um, towards the end as well because 
The reason for that is it's harder than to say no after they've just said yes three times. So that can look like questions like, oh, you told me you're interested in doing classes. This is a class I can really see you enjoying, isn't it? They'll say yes. Um, we've just had new equipment put in the, in the gym. Um, it's great, isn't it? Yes. Um, would you like to join? No. What do you mean? Well, why not? So uh, it, it becomes harder for them to say no when they're already telling themselves yes, and it just reinforces their decision for coming in and inquiring. So we've done the, uh, the closing section. Um, now you're obviously going to have objections. Um, a lot of the time we can overcome our objections in the needs analysis. It's a great way for us to do that. So you ask a lot of them questions during the needs analysis. So you'd be asking questions like, if I can show you everything that you're looking for today, you're in a position to join. Or are you joining with anyone else? Is your partner interested? They might say yes or no. But you've got that information. So when you're doing the tour, you've got that. People buy from people they trust. It's that simple. Um, I, I wouldn't buy from someone that I've walked away from and thought, oh, I'm not sure about that. Some common objections that I see, and I, I'll put it out to the crowd as well. What are common objections that you're seeing currently in your, in your gyms? Time. Time, absolutely. Any others? Amazing. No objections. But these are some of the common objections that I used to see when I was uh, working in, in club. So want to think about it, talk to your partner. Uh, fear, gym intimidation, they may not have been a member anywhere before. Um, too expensive. Now, price is only an objection when you haven't created enough value. Simple as that. Um, don't have the time, can't commit. And then they may have a tour with a competitor. Um, that one is, is quite a common one. Uh, depending on where you're located. Now, we are going to get objections. We're not always going to sell people. And there's a few different techniques that we can use, but the, my favorite one is Lair. Has anyone heard of Lair? So Lair is a technique that we use where it's listen, acknowledge, explore, and respond. So we listen to their objection. We acknowledge their concerns. We re-explore their needs and their goals. And then we respond with a solution. So that could look like, Maddie, I've tried to sell you a gym membership and you've told me it's too expensive. I'm listening. I acknowledge that, Maddie, I understand your, uh, your concern there and it's a, it's a massive financial commitment, but I wanna just re-explore why you've come into the gym today and why you've made the step to bettering yourself for your goals. You told me you have a wedding next year that you wanna be in the best shape of your life for. Absolutely. And then wouldn't that make sense then from the things that I've shown you, you've said you love the classes, the PTs are really helpful and supportive. Doesn't the cost, uh, doesn't the value outweigh the cost in regards to that? Now, at this point, they might say yes or no. If they say no and they object again, then you do the LAE again and then you respond. So you don't give up. But again, we don't want to be a pushy salesperson. We then talk to them about the follow-up process. Listen, all right, I know you want to think about it, it's a big decision. Um, is it okay if I send you out some information via an email um, and I'll give you a call in two days just to follow up with you to see where you are. They will then go away from that thinking, he's a really nice guy actually, he's, he, I, I, he's built trust, I've built trust there. Um, and that's overcoming objections. So in conclusion, sales doesn't have to be a dirty word. Let's shift the narrative around sales and recognize its true value. Sales, it's not a dirty word, it's a powerful tool for building relationships, creating value, and achieving success. Uh, I implore all of you to embrace sales as a force for positive change for both you, your members, and your business. Thanks very much, I'm happy to take questions, and if you wanna know any more about what we do at Gym Sales, I've attached a QR code here which you can take a picture of. It's got some e-books on there, some white papers, um, and if you wanna have a live demo, you can arrange a demo with me. Thank you. Not quite 45 minutes, guys, but it's the first time I've done that, so. <laughs> Are there any questions? Do you work with any software to people's sales process? Do you like recommend any particular software package? In regards to what, sorry? So, um, like the deal pipelines and automated emails and things like that? That's exactly what we do. Yeah, so that's what the software is. It's an automated um, lead management tool. So it can, be, it can be automated or it can be used manually as well. Um, so yeah, we, we help build out. So when we talk about the follow-up process, um, a lot of the time, 
people inquire, but independent gyms especially are understaffed or they don't have the resources for where someone's dedicated salesperson. So our, our software allows uh, an email or a text message to be sent instantly to thank them for their inquiry and also book a time to come and visit. And then we'd obviously prompt you for a phone call as well. And then as they go through their sales journey, whether they're a guest, a tour, a trial, it will trigger different automations as well. No, that's our software. Yeah, so it's, it's built um, for the fitness industry. Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's exactly like a CRM, but for the fitness industry. You'd probably get a feeling from the person. Um, and at the time of touring and speaking to them, you're going to get a gauge if they've got the buy-in or if they're saying yeses or noes or if they're a bit closed off, which is fine. You're not going to sell to everyone. You can't do it. It's impossible. Um, the best thing I find to do in that regard is what I said is, is try and overcome it once. Don't try and come, overcome it two, three times. Give them the, uh, the freedom to walk away and then follow up with them properly and then nine times out of ten well, I say nine times out of ten that's not a fact don't quote me on it but usually you'll find that they'll they'll come back and they'll they'll trust you because you've given them that space so that's that's just my two cents <laughs> any other questions guys or observations it's part of the it's part of the process as well no no it's part of the onboarding process I book you to do like training with my staff in the gym? Oh, just for that? sales yeah, yeah, without yeah. the product? Yeah. I mean, you, yeah, you could probably could do, but <laughs> that's a different conversation uh, off the record, my friend. <laughs> yeah, but no, no. So I obviously solely work for gym sales, but if you had gym sales as a product, then we would provide the sales training as well. Any other questions, guys, or observations? Thank you very much for your time. Cheers.